Center for the Study of Hindu Traditions, CHITRA for short, it's an acronym, Center Hindu Traditions. I'd like to welcome you to the first of four talks on bhakti this month. Before I proceed, I wanted to acknowledge our collective concern. In my case, I'd like to use the word distress over the grim situation in India. Almost every one of us have lost friends and colleagues or know people affected by COVID. So many of our colleagues there at various times have been part of this larger Chitra family. The Center for the Study of Hindu Traditions was founded, um, I think it's two, yeah, 2005, to encourage the research, teaching, and public understanding of Hindu culture and traditions. And I see several people who are involved in the beginning um, here today. Housed in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, our center emphasizes interdisciplinary work and the study of global Hindu traditions. Earlier seminars and lectures, um, and we've had the privilege of many of you here participate in them over the last um, 16 years, have been held in the fields of art, architecture, Asian languages and literatures, philosophy, performing arts, healing, women's studies and the environment. Um, also water, gender and social justice issues. A special partner has been uh, the Hahn Museum of Art at the University of Florida. The idea for the series came suddenly earlier this year uh, when Jack Hawley and I were talking about Bhakti and he has been very important in helping me think through this, this series. He'll be co-hosting the series um, later on. Many thanks also to Carla Bellamy, uh, Daniel McKibbee, who shared the format of the South Asia seminar series at Columbia University. And a most special thanks to Michael Schuster of UF here at University of Florida for helping me with the registration. Dr. Bill Genherut is an associate professor in the Religious Studies Department, University of South Florida. His research interests include pre-modern religious literature in Kannada language, South Asian bhakti, um, bhakti traditions, translations in South Asia, and programming in digital humanities. His book, uh, his book Shiva Saints, The Origins of Devotion in Kannada, according to Harihara Ragela Guru, Oxford University Press, is the first study in English of the earliest Shaiva hagiographies in Canada speaking region. Uh, A.K. Ramanujan introduced the vachanas from the Karnataka Shiva tradition, Shiva Bhakti tradition. Um, I'm not using the word Lingayat or Vira Shaiva here because of the identity issues. Um, and Raman's work came out almost 50 years ago, 1973. We have a new generation of works focusing on Kannada language materials and bhakti from that region. Gill's book tells us that bhakti to Shiva defined the, ident uh, defined the identity of the community more in terms of bhakti, devotion, rather than using words like Veera Shaiva and Lingayata. And that the tradition was large enough a large enough umbrella to bring in folks from different castes, different classes, and varying levels of orthopraxy. To tell us more about his latest research, as, as well as help us think through where we are today in bhakti studies from that region, we have Professor Gail ben Hero today. Um, and as we go on through the month, we'll have more scholars, more friends, talking to us about where bhakti has been, is right now in terms of scholarly studies, and where we are going. Thank you so much, Gil. Hi, Join everyone. Uh, thank you, Vasu, um, for this uh, wonderful introduction and arranging this event. Uh, kind of on the technological front, I am I seen? On the on the screen, is it working? 
Um, okay, thank you. Um, I wish to thank Vasu, indeed, and everyone involved in making this lecture happen. I also wish to express, like Vasu, our shared hope that India recovers quickly from this pandemic surge. And to those of you joining us from India, please know that our hearts are with you. I'm going to share my uh, screen for a slideshow I presented, I prepared. Um, Let's see if this works, okay. Can everyone see the uh, slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. In this lecture, I reflect on the translation of bhakti materials, specifically poems attributed to saints and the hagiographies about them, based on my own experience in translating stories of bhakti saints from 12th century Karnataka. Through this reflection, I wish to also consider more general issues that pertain to translations from regional Indian languages to English, while paying attention to cross-cultural sensibilities at this moment in time. At the end of the lecture, I will relate this work to the field of bhakti studies as I see it today. For the past three years, <clears throat> I have been co-translating selected stories from a corpus of hagiographies written by Hampeya Harihara, an accomplished poet in the Kannada language. Harihara lived in the town of Hampi, located in the southern region of the Deccan, South India, during the early decades of the 13th century. He composed several notable works in Kannada using the familiar, conventional, and complicated styles that are associated with Marga, the pan-Indian, heavily Sanskritized, and courtly literary culture. But I would argue that Harihara's contribution to the world of Kannada literature stemmed from his use of a different style in composing a collection of stories about Shaiva saints. The corpus, consisting of more than a hundred stories and tens of thousands of lines, is conventionally referred to as Shiva Sharanara Ragalegalu, or stories of Shiva's saints in the Ragale meter. Unlike the fixed syllabic based meters in Kannada compositions, which were borrowed from Sanskrit, the Aksharabritas, the Ragale belongs to a group of local and more flexible meters with prosodical units based on vowel count, matre or more. Up until the time of Harihara, the Ragale meter has been used only occasionally and sporadically his application of this meter for writing complete stories was no less than groundbreaking. It also posed specific challenges in the work of translation, an issue to which I will return. There is consensus among Kannada literati about this author's historical contribution to poetic composition. However, the significance of, Ragale, of the Ragale corpus stems not only from its literary merit, but also from its place in the, in the religious history of South India. The Ragale Corpus was the first written account of the Sharanas, the Shaiva devotional figures who lived in the Kannada speaking region only a few decades earlier, in the middle of the 12th century. The saints in the Ragale Corpus, including famous Vachana composers such as Alama Prabhu, Akka Mahadevi and Basavana, which we're seeing here, over time inspired the creation of religious communities that came to be known as Virashaivas or Lingayats, which are prominent in Karnataka today. My book, Shiva Saints, which was published in 2018 by Oxford University Press, presents a close reading of key portions of the Ragale Corpus that deal with the progenitors of the Shaiva devotional tradition of the Kannada speaking region. In the book, I challenge inherited wisdom about the nascent tradition arguing that the local culture of devotion was far more inclusive and diverse than its later configurations. Since the publication of my book, impelled by the historical importance of the Ragale Corpus and by the elegance of the saints stories in it, I have been engaged in translating selections from the Ragale Corpus for a separate project together with my mentor and collaborator, RVS Sundaram. In late 2018, the project was awarded the American Academy of Religions Collaborative International Research Grant. And at the end of the summer of 2020, we completed a first draft of the translation, 
We are now working on the text critical apparatus introduction and appendices. The work is tentatively titled Stories of Shiva's Saints. And in that sense, this project continues from Shiva's Saints to Stories of Shiva's Saints. In this presentation, I will focus on several aspects of our project and discuss some of the strategies we have adopted or developed in translating Harihara's text. A possible starting point to thinking about translation in South Asian of South, of South Asian literature to English could be what Harish Trivedi terms addressivity. And I'm reading, can one ever begin to hope to translate addressivity? That is the relationship of the author with his primary implied readership with which he shares a cultural universe and a whole host of assumptions about everything in the world, but all of which must be laboriously spelt out or simply and silently lost in translation. Trivedi points to an inevitable situation in which the translator is constantly required to choose between two evils, being a bore or being mute. Wendy Doniger wrote in 1971 that the translation cannot be both beautiful and faithful. She is referring to the perennial push and pull that is inherent in the labor of imperfection called translation. A good translation must, on the one hand, faithfully represent the meaning of the original language in the source material, and on the other, conform to the accepted standards of the target language. Producing a translation that effectively balances the push and pull of these requirements has always been challenging. But in the current period, with the purported flattening of cultural differences enhanced by the increased use of digitally mediated technologies, the challenge has become somewhat paradoxically bigger than ever. In translating specifically from Indian sources, there are two contemporary factors that contribute to the challenge. The first is the growing sensibility of Indian culture to how it is represented, a sensibility that is nurtured by a growing diaspora, globalization and anti-globalization trends, post-colonial studies and identity politics. The second, and this applies to more than just translation from Indian languages, is the pressure to cater to the growing uninformed readership of the digital era with its diminishing skills in reading literature, especially that of another culture. In the discussion that follows, I will provide examples of how these factors affect the craft of translation and suggest possible ways for moving forward in light of the demands of our current era. The first issue I would like to address pertains to any translation from an Indian language to Western one. It seems beguilingly simple. How are we to refer to the figures depicted in the text, some of whom, especially the pan-Indian deities, have dozens of proper names and epithets? Laurie Patton referred to this problem in the context of her translation of the Bhagavad Gita by raising the question, is Yudhishthira firm in battle? A question that does not have to do with Yudhishthira's combative abilities, which we all know are nothing to take pride in, but instead with the meaning of the compound Yudhishthira, and on whether to translate epithets or leave them as they appear in the original. In a deeper sense, this question asks whether epithets in Indian text should be taken as proper names that belong to a large pool of synonyms for a known character, or should they instead be understood as meaningful signifiers on their own? Here, for example, firm in battle could be read as a tongue-in-cheek comment aimed at the wistful Yudhishthira. I find that this ostensibly narrow and technical question touches on a meaningful cross-cultural conversation. This question also spawned a sharp debate in translating devotional literature from Canada. Speaking of Shiva is the name of a masterful translation of Canada devotional poems called Vachanas to English by A. K. Ramanujan. Since its appearance in 1973, this book has been widely read both in classes about Hinduism and Indian literature and by the general public. The book has also had an immense influence on the practice of translating poetry from Indian languages to English. One of A.K. Ramanujan's bold decisions in this work was to translate 
the names with which devotees address Shiva. Kudara Sangama Deva becomes Lord of the Meeting Rivers and Guheshvara becomes Lord of Caves. In the introduction to the translations, Ramanujan discusses his choice to translate proper names, explaining that the etymologies of the gods' names are integral for the meaning making of the poems. And I'm reading, the etymologies of the Sanskrit names are never far from the surface and often participate in the poetry. The proper name Guheshvara, Lord of Caves, is appropriate to Allama. His favorite imagery is of dark and light. Such quickening of etymologies in the poetry is one reason for translating attributive proper names into literal English, hoping that by using them constantly as a repetitive formula, they will keep their chanting refrain quality and work as unique proper names. Ramanujan's choice of translating proper names is sharply contested by Tejasvini Niranjana in her book from 1992. In a chapter titled, Translation as Disruption, she presents a scathing review of Ramanujan's translations of Achanas, in which she argues that the proper names in the original Kannada is, I quote, obscured by simple translation. And she adds, given the colonialism's violence erases, given, I'm sorry, given that colonialism's violence erases or distorts beyond recognition the names of the colonized, it seems important not to translate proper names in a post-colonial or decolonizing practice. It should be noted that scholars have characterized Niranjana's understanding of translation as primarily an act of narrow political resistance, an opinion that I share. But I also agree with Niranjana's viewpoint regarding the importance of preserving the proper names in the original. Furthermore, foregoing the sound of a proper name whether in Sanskrit, Kannada, or any other language, runs the risk of alienating informed readers who value the oral dimension of verbal expression. On the other hand, Ramanujan's wish to translate proper names so that they can participate in the larger meaning of the sentence, poem, or work is important, and it would be remiss not to deliver to the English reader the meaning of a name which oftentimes helps communicate the deeper resonances and suggestions of a text, whether explanatory, humorous, or other. To address this issue adequately in our own translation project, Sundaram and I decided to apply different strategies according to context. In the following example, Shiva is mentioned twice in the verse. The second instance refers to a local manifestation of Shiva called Virupaksha, Harihara's chosen deity who resides in Hampi. In such a case where Shiva's appellation bears local significance and is associated with a particular devotee, here Harihara himself, we were careful to keep the original name, but also to add an explanation of the name's meaning. I will first read the whole verse, which opens the story about Allama Prabhu, and then the highlighted area inside the lotus hearts of various saints, Lord Shiva dwells. He who is served by all the gods and is dark of throat, pondered with affection Alama the Celestial. This is the three-eyed Shiva Virupaksha of Hampi. Notice the highlighted phrase, three-eyed Shiva Virupaksha of Hampi, which preserves Shiva's proper name, but also conveys its meaning. In this example, we can observe another variation of the problem of epithets, this time having to do with Shiva's appellation, Nila Grivan, dark throat. The more familiar equivalent expression, Nila Kanta, is a proper name of Shiva, and we needed to take a decision on whether it was more important to convey the proper name or to translate it. In such cases, when Shiva is addressed without a specific affiliation to a locale, we tended to translate, to translate the epithets. We adopted this approach because of the bewildering plethora of proper names used for referring to Shiva and because of the large lexical base of Kannada and Sanskrit that Harihara employs to address and refer to the god. Here, for example, Harihara replaces the more familiar Kanta with its synonym Griva, and therefore we opted for greater readability by the general reader 
by translating Nila Griva as dark of throat. Instead of transliterating a battery of signifiers, some of which are well known and some obscure, all addressing one God in here, just a casual example, Purari, um, Kantuhara, Nagabhushana, Bhava, Abhava, and there are many, many others. We opted for a richer reading experience by translating their meaning. The foe of the cities, the slayer of the God of love, the God decorated with serpents, the source of being, the unborn God, and so on. Such, such subtle decisions again highlight the imperfection of the act of translation and point to the difficulty of navigating conflicting cultural demands in a successful manner. In sum, between Romanujan's anglicized approach from the 70s and Niranjana's decolo decolonized militancy from the 90s, we wish at this point in time to carve out with our work a middle path that preserves the original nomenclature and phonic dimension, but is also attuned to the needs of the uninitiated target audiences. By heeding Niranjana's political sensibilities, but less radically, and adopting Ramanujan's lyrical sensibility, albeit partially, we hope to cater both to informed as well as uninformed audiences by constantly oscillating between Trivedi's notion of laboriously spelling out and losing in silence. The second matter I wish to discuss today is tied to the text prosodical arrangement. Laurie Patton, in a note to her translation of the Bhagavad Gita, frames her choice to translate in verse form by raising the question, what would be the contemporary cultural equivalent of the easygoing and flexible shloka in ancient India? By raising this question, Patton brings to the fore of the act of translation an enhanced sensitivity to the cadence of the meter in the original and the challenge of carrying it over to the target text. We have used this question as a starting point for thinking about the meter arrangement or the metrical arrangement of the Ragale corpus. In general, the stories in Harihara's collection are written in the Ragale meter in short couplet lines. As this slide shows, each line in this simple meter consists of four metrically equivalent groups or ganas. We see here one, two, three, and four. Each of these ganas counting the same number of moras or beats. In this case, four beats, in this five, and here ganas of three beats. It does not matter which syllables, whether long or short, are used inside the group, as long as the total number of beats is identical. Thus, a group of four beats can consist of two long syllables, one long and two short ones, or four short ones. This simple and symmetrical structure generates a rhythmic and repetitive effect. Since the Ragale meter places no restriction on the number of couplets, reading the text or listening to it generates an ongoing flow of narrative without punctuation or metrical stops. This feature and the straightforward plotting of the stories led to our basic choice to render the English translation as prose. Our choice was similar to that of Vercheru Narana Rao and Jean Rogher in their landmark translation of Palkuri Somanata's Basava Puranamu, a Telugu work that is contemporaneous with the Ragale corpus and that maintains many parallels with it, including the use of a local meter and simple ongoing couplets called Dvipada. So Dvipada in Telugu and Ragale in Kannada. They're not identical, but they're very similar. But the seemingly simple structure of ongoing couplets in Kannada or in Telugu masks a dramatic level of variation in tone, voice, and register that can be found in these works, a variation that is difficult to convey in prose. Narayana Rao himself, here writing with David Schulman, comments on this issue. 
we have translated the very fluid and versatile Dvipada verse form into prose. In the hands of Somanata, the author of the Bhastava Puranamu, Dvipada changes rapidly from song to conversation, from fast paced narration to hymns of praise, incorporating complex syntactic patterns in the ostensibly simple strings of couplets. No subsequent Dvipada poet ever attempted anything like this expressive range. Harihara's sophisticated application of Ragale is very similar to what is described here with regard to Somanata's application of Dvipada. For example, at climatic moments, such as a saint's auspicious human birth or a saint's encounter with the God, Harihara, Harihara's authorial voice might shift from thematic to lyrical, highlighting the devotee's emotional experience through the use of syntactical repetitions and elaborate ornamentation. Such passages, though usually short, appear frequently in the text. In order to convey to the English reader these stylistic and textural shifts, we decided to insert free verse into the prose passages. This occasional opting for short lines presents a marked shift in authorial voice. We believe that this alternation, despite its formal inconsistency with the metrical form of the original Kannada version, will draw attention to climatic moments in the narrative and facilitate insightful reading by the target audiences of English speakers. The following excerpts from our translation demonstrates what I have just described. What appears like an ongoing constant stream of lines here in Canada, in transliteration of the Canada actually hides inside it a heightened four line passage in yellow with an extended metaphor that celebrates the moment of Alama Prabhu's birth on earth. I will begin to read the prose. For nine months, her beauty, that is Alama's human mother, her beauty developed until the baby ready to appear but awaiting the appointed hour came out at an auspicious moment, as was fitting. Like the sun emerging from the east, like the moon born of the beautiful milky ocean, like a sapling of the celestial wish-granting tree gracefully taking root on earth, Nirmaya was wonderfully born as a child. Whether we noticed that Harihara had switched the register of the text Oh, I'm sorry, whenever we noticed that Harihara had switched the register of the text into a poetic description with parallel structures or into extremely emotional passages with first person exclamations, we switched the English rendering to free verse in order to indicate that moment for the reader. Another prosodic feature of the text that merits attention is the fact that the longer stories with multiple chapters alternate between ragale and prose. In the slide shown here, we see the end of the first chapter of the story about Basavanna, which is written in the ragale meter here, and the opening of the second chapter, which is written in prose beginning here. This alternation is consistent in all the stories of more than one chapter with odd chapters in the ragale and even ones in prose. This formal system of alternating between verse and prose is difficult to preserve in translation because it is completely disconnected from plot progression. In fact, we strongly maintain that the switching between verse and prose chapters in, in, is related to the text's performance rather to its content. For this reason, we decided to preserve our system of prose verse switching also in the prose chapters of the original. Here we see an, exam an excerpt from the second chapter of Basamana's story with the original prose section followed by our translation in prose and free verse. Without the, discussing the entire passage, I draw your attention to the parallel structure 
of the two similes in the last section, highlighted in green, which we wanted to preserve by using short verses. So here is the original green excerpt in a flow of prose. And of course, punctuation in the print is just a modern addition to it versus what we see here in the English rendering translation, his vine-like eyebrow shone like the borders of the country of his forehead and the spot dotted with white ash was like the capital city of the forehead-eyed Lord. Placing Harihara's source text in Canada, in Canada on one side of the page and our English translation on the other side reveals the differences in format. Our choice to render prose as verse and verse as prose is indeed far from the form of the original. However, we consider this to be simply a technicality and argue that paradoxically by making this bold formatting move, we create an English text that is closer to the original than a mechanical rendering of the whole passage in verse or in prose. There are other translational issues I would have liked to broach, such as transliteration and diacritics, which is, um, I think it's an area that undergoes transformation in recent years local idioms, expressions, and the cultural life they convey, which we as translators are compelled to alter in order to make sense for the target audience. Or in other cases, translate literally, but add some kind of explanatory footnote. And the act of translating exclamations and other sounds and there are many such other issues, um, but for the shortage of time, I turn now instead to my concluding words about the broader state of the field of bhakti studies. I think it would not be an exaggeration to say that the study of bhakti traditions is undergoing an exciting period of growth and expansion. It can be thought of as the coming into being of trends and directions that were pointed at in previous decades. Without invalidating the legitimate and relevant critique of the inherited misuse of the label bhakti by colonialists and others, and by adopting an open framework for addressing various religious realms in which bhakti in whatever way this term is understood. The academic examination of both emic and etic uses of bhakti has deepened, has deepened in recent years with the emergence of nuanced historical studies of regional devotional traditions and their inter-regional connections and resonances. More and more dissertations, books, edited volumes, translations and articles about bhakti traditions display a new sensibility for regional languages, their relation to Sanskrit and the Pan-Indian, their relation to other regional languages of the period, and their relation to the languages own multiple written and oral registers across time. A new sensibility for regionality itself has emerged as an important framework for studying the historical and sociological background of specific devotional traditions. Perhaps more importantly, there is a new sensibility for context as a defining feature of any specific cultural product we associate with bhakti. The shown books are of course just a selection out of an amazingly impressive new array of works. I cannot stress enough what I consider to be of utmost importance in this storm of books, to paraphrase from Jack Hawley's pivotal work. And that is the role of translations. Traditionally considered as secondary in the rigid structure of academic production of knowledge, translations are nevertheless of critical importance by providing direct access to primary cultural materials, both written and oral. They infuse any academic field of cultural study with life. 
specifically in relation to the study of devotional traditions in South Asia. It is the work of translation that facilitates a meaningful cross-regional conversation by bridging regions, languages, and traditions. To illustrate the significance of translations, I could casually refer to the title Jack chose for the recent iteration of his Bhakti seminar, which is up here, Love Translated. And to the central question in this course, how does Bhakti poetry song translate across linguistic divisions within India and into English? In my own experience in teaching seminars on Bhakti, the most repeated request from students is to read in the class more of the poems and stories, as these indeed provide an immensely useful resource for learning the intricacies of each tradition and allow the students to truly appreciate the rich experience of lived bhakti. The task of translating bhakti materials in the regional languages carries a set of specific challenges and questions that merit scholarly reflection. In my presentation, I touched on a few technical aspects of this labor, but there are other issues. Consider, for example, which texts are chosen for translation and which are not. In absence of pan-Indian reputation and possibly also canonization, whether historical canonization or a manufactured one, such choices are not obvious nor trivial. What is the position and role of a specific text chosen for translation in the overall cultural output of a tradition throughout history? And what are the possible measures for appraising that? How do such choices shape the way a particular tradition is perceived by outsiders to it? And what implications might this external curation have for those who participate in the tradition today? Another inherent challenge in translation is the written medium itself and its shortcomings. As our recognition of the importance of lived experience in Bhakti tradition grows, so does the understanding of the limited nature of a fixed, written down, and textual publication. Jack asks in his syllabus, how does the musical medium in which these poems are typically experienced influence the sense of what translation means for a bhakti poem? How do we address this lacuna? And should we, as an example, compensate for the inevitable transition to the written English by incorporating live or recorded devotional performances of singing, dancing, and celebrating the God in our work. In this way and in others, translations of bhakti materials touch on a core question. Should we study and teach bhakti as a universal experience that everyone can engage with? Or do we, by that, run the risk of trivializing it? Alternatively, is bhakti a foreign experience and should it deliberately be presented in our work as belonging to another culture, era, or world? I will end with a final word about the RBSN, the Regional Bhakti Scholars Network, which was founded by John Coyne and me seven years ago in which scholars from different areas and disciplines share their research and consider together questions such as those I raised here um, between regional Bhakti traditions. Our aim is to develop a new focus or rather many new foci in order to study Bhakti in its multiple regional appearances and to consider broad issues about the cohesion of Bhakti as an analytical term for what appears more and more to be a very colorful mosaic. I invite you to visit our website where you will find information about various activities, symposia, publications, and digital tools for the study and pedagogy of Bhakti. With this, I shall end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gil. Thank you so much for a very rich talk. Appreciate it. We have a few questions coming in. A reminder, if you have questions, please put them in chat. And after 
our um, question and answer period. We will unmute ourselves and have an informal get together with Gil. But please join me in showing your appreciation for Gil's wonderful talk today. Thank you. And please remember this is the first in the feast of four. This is a dinner with uh, four different entrees consuming buffet. Um, next week, next Friday, it'll be John, followed by Harshita, and in the last week, Heidi. Uh, so do join us for all of them. So we have a few questions. Um, we have one from a, a professor here at UF, Professor Nagaraj Arakere. Enjoying your talk very much. Can you read, uh, can you recite in Kannada? My exposure to vachanas are mainly through music. Malikarjun Mansur has sung the vachanas in Kannada beautifully. I, um, I, in, this, in this presentation, in this slideshow, I don't have a, a vachana to recite as much as it would have been lovely. Um, and I can find one. I mean, you know, it will take me some time to uh, locate it if you're interested. But um, yeah, I would, yeah. I mean, I can read it technically. I cannot read it as a performance, the Ragale. And uh, I would say 90% of that is my own shortcomings, but 10% is, is because we don't have any performance culture of Ragales. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of piggy writing the question. Uh, to make a comment on a tradition that is lost of performing ragales and hearing how ragales are performed in context. But they do have a very ongoing flow, which is, which is, which is, which is kind of a double-edged sword. They're very pleasant to hear, but they can lull you into monotony at the same time. Um, I'm looking right now Can you see the screen I'm sharing? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, okay. So the first line begins here, right? Shri Ganani Kayadindo Pekaila Sadol Boganiti Ampeya Virupakshano Padol Harushadindo Lagango Tu Kolire Bandu I'll stop here, not to create the, you know, not to harm the tradition anymore. Uh, but you could, I think you could, you can even sense some of the musicality, right? There is the alliteration famously present in Canada and um, uh, opening alliteration and rhyming and ending rhyming and so on. Oh, uh, Vasu. Vasu. I should learn to unmute myself here. A lot of other questions coming up, Gil. From Irina, what kind of audience do you call your target audience, Gil? Aren't there ranks? Are, what is the last uh, part of this? Are there ranks? Is there mm -hmm. a hierarchy? Uh, ranks. Um, complicated. I don't know. I mean, I, I think, to, to be honest, I think that this question is determined, or the answer to this question is determined firstly by the publication. Honestly, I mean, if you, when, when we do this kind of translation work, we think about target, we imagine everything we do in writing, we imagine someone who is uh, eager to read it. Uh, who is that person? So I think what I try to stress here, Sundaram and myself, we try to stress uh, is, a, is, a, is a collection of several target audiences. Um, and like I, I showed in the presentation, it does, it obviously uh, uh, considers the uninitiated by translating the names, by explaining the cultural differences. 
but I think at the same time, and I didn't have to fight for this, Sundaram brought that. I mean, working with, with uh, you know, an accomplished scholar in India, and I need to credit him fully for this work or 50-50. And what he brought to the table was exactly the readership, which is informed and his expectations of what is coming out of the text. So there is no kind of a simple answer to this. It's, um, I mean, in a way, all my presentation is, is an, a, an attempt to apologize for that movement, but, but there is no point where it stops. Okay, the next question from um, Harshita. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm wondering if there are areas of the text that have a particular aesthetic sentiment that may have shaped your translation choices. Also, I'm wondering if Harihara uses Slesha and if so, what choices have you made in that? That's a big question. No Schlesha. Thank God, no Schlesha. I mean, there are so, so there are different ways of translating Schlesha, but it's not in my text, so I'm not going to think about it now. But it's but it, Schleschas are a challenge of, of its own its own category. Um, definitely, and I'm not sure, I, I, Harshita, if you, I'm not sure I'm fully grasping your question, but the aesthetic sentiment is very much at the forefront of this regale. In other words, this is not, it's, it's a narrative, but it's an emotional narration. It has a quality of performance and of a, of a community celebrating Shiva. So I'm connecting it to an aesthetic sensibility, especially emotional. There are moments of um, Bhakti Rasa. I don't know if Hamsa is here. I don't know if you will agree if there is even such a thing, right? So Bhakti Rasa maybe. Uh, other moments, sadness or violence or love, even erotic love, the sentiment is at the forefront. So it's definitely shaped uh, uh, the way we chose to translate. But if I'm missing anything more particular in your question, Harshita, then let me know. From Nimeshika Venkatesan, thank you very much for your invigorating talk. How do you look at the intersections of folklorist, folkloristics as an analytical engagement, especially in the context of Veera Shaiva practices, such as the personal expression that is emphasized in creation of Vachana poetry. Yes, um, I'm not sure uh, the, 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 the personal expression, Okay, there is something complex emphasizing the creation of Vachana poetry. In other words, in the ethos of Vachana being a kind of an spontaneous Vachana speech, um, which I am, I mean, that's my, that's my next project actually. I'm trying to understand the reception of Vachanas in history, tracing its original moments, the earliest evidence of vachanas that we can find and moving up the centuries. And I'm saying that because in fact, the moment where vachanas were created uh, or that life setting in the Anubhava Mantapa, in the hall of experience where vachana kara speaker is, is <laughs> gains momentum three, gen, three centuries after in the Shune Sampadane, in the Virakta era. Not, not in the earlier period. There is something in the earlier period. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about it. That's my next one. But so that kind of a, a one response. The second issue of folklore, quickly. Th there is a problem with folk as a category. We all know. What do we mean? Volk, folk. Uh, I, 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 I don't want to disregard folk. But so I, I'm going to use the term non-elite to be more specific and clear. Non-elite cultures have different characterizations in their cultural production than those of the elite, different ways of transmission, of performance, of the registers, everything, of course. Now, interestingly, I think my opinion is that Harihara doesn't opt for one of these two edges. He's doing in this very text, 
stuff, which is very complicated, not as much as Shlesha, as Harshita has, but pretty complex Sanskrit constructions on the one. And then on the other hand, yele, 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 whole, uh, all kind, kind of exclamations and simplified structures and harsh language, which you would associate with non-elite. And it, actually it's very hard to imagine. We need to kind of extrapolate a culture from his movement between these registers. Thank you. From John Court, Gil Nystop, you start with a nod to the faithful slash free dichotomy. This is a theory discussion with a long history in the Christian West. In my experience with North Indian vernaculars, discussion of the issue of faithfulness is largely absent in pre-modern, pre-colonial South Asia. Is there any analogous discussion of translation theory in Canada before the modern period? Fantastic question. And I thank you, John, uh, for touching on this issue. I mean, I'm, I learned a lot from John's, John Court's article on translating North Indian vernaculars on the absence of a theory of translation in India in the pre-modern pre era. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating even in the sense of the presentation I gave today with Harihara and Somanata, Kannada, Telugu, generating so, so, such similar texts. And then these texts are translated between the vernaculars in the pre-modern. Immediate, the, the immediate short answer to your question, no, I'm not aware of any uh, a systematic reflection about translation in Kannada in this period, right, before the advance of, uh, of Europe and so on. But I would, I, would, I would consider, you know, talking, for example, with Eric Gurevich, uh, who's writing his dissertation now on University of Chicago, and he's tracking the intellectual traditions um, uh, produced at courts in Canada. And he might have uh, stumbled, about, uh, stumbled upon something that I didn't. But it's fascinating, and it's very, a very pertinent question in this milieu. Shaivas in South India, they write in Tamil, <clears throat> Telugu, Kannada, and other languages, and they, th those stories, those songs circulate and are being translated in, in complex ways, which we don't yet know enough about. That's how I would say it. Uh, next question from Hannah Kim. Can you address, if any, the pressures that you have experienced or preemptively considered, given what you have noted, is one significant audience, the diaspora or bigger uninformed readership in the digital era? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. First of all, I cannot, oh, okay. Now I located and of translating. Middle way. Um, are we reading the same comment? No. I guess not, right? So uh, I can come back to this. Can you address if any of the pressures that you're, oh, a, a preemptive consider? Okay, uh, pressures. I think, uh, no, not, not externally. As a, as a scholar, I make it a point to internalize all the pressures, you know, to experience them within voices in my head that I imagine. We try, we try to, to we try. Our work is, an, is, 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 is emerging. It's a work of, of affect. I'm trying to be attuned to different voices, but some of the scholars here and others have, have acknowledged the fact we cannot really anticipate reception in this day and age. Reception is really a wild card. So I, I cannot refer to any kind of, you know, other than, than obviously showing my translations to different, to different audiences, but Nothing I can put it here as a kind of a conclusion. We have a question from Heidi, who we'll, we'll be hearing from later this month. Heidi Powells, thank you for a wonderful presentation. In the classroom, I think there's nothing that beats hearing the artist's performance in all its depth of emotion. I really appreciate your sharing your thinking and navigating the translation process. Your point about which texts get chosen for translation is an important one. 
the needs for students of students are one thing. The need of making accessible sources to scholars is one that has been less popular with publishers, but should not be neglected either. Have you been caught in that quandary before between publisher interests and your own intellectual agenda? So again, first of all, uh, not on the outside. Uh, I have conversations with some publishers and they're very generous and patient. I, I cannot really point to that other than my own internal expectations for myself, for my own work. Uh, but yes, you, you touch on such an accurate, you, you capture this very accurately, right? We, we come to these moments, we say, wait a minute, this term has significance for scholars, it needs to be preserved, it needs to be carried over. On the other hand, and you mentioned it here, everyone here, I'm, I, all the teachers in this room share the experience of reading with students text that uh, have, have lost moments of pedagogy last moments where where moments of pedagogy are lost because of a term and you need to pause and explain and you you hope they get what you're explaining during the reading it's a complicated dance what we try to do in this translation is think about um levels or register so the the the, the text itself is most amenable to the uninitiated i would put it this way with with some footnotes for them but we also wrote end notes with more technical comments. So for example, if there is a word, I'm still playing with the idea of doing a very simple transliteration in the text itself. But on the technical notes at the end, where I want to quote a certain patantara, a certain manuscript variation, I will use the exact transliteration, of course. So again, we're trying to do uh, uh, diver kind of sophisticated strategies, let's put it this way, to cater scholars and, and the students, if we put it this way. But it's difficult. It's not, you cannot, you cannot win this battle always. A question from Jack Hawley. What a great talk. I was fascinated to hear about the alternation of verse and prose in the performance of Prabhudevara's Ragale. Why? What does this feel like? On another front, how or to what extent do issues of critical edition and manuscript research figure into what a person decides what to translate? Is editing critically a move that is in some way antithetical to Buckley, that living thing? I mean, you know, I can say Yes, definitely, of course. I mean, and, 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 and if this is just the tip of the iceberg, right, Jack? Because even if we, how do we cope with these challenges once we broach them? Okay, so we are aware of these shortcomings. Do we publish multiple versions to convey that? I mean, it's, it's just endless. One, and one obvious thing that, again, all of us in this virtual room do, but we need to acknowledge it, is playing videos in this digital age, somehow it became such an accessible, useful tool. I don't do it enough, I must say. I had a wonderful conversation uh, with my colleague, John Coyne, who is my partner for the RBSN, and he helped me formulate some of the thoughts about this. And he was showing me a video. He has a performance of Bhakti performance. That is a kind of a movie enactment of a Bhakti performance that he shows to his students where he translated the Marathi in order to show the, 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 the wordplay and the puns and the interaction that goes live. Now, of course, such things cannot be done. They, they can only give a taste and they cannot be grasped fully by, by students, but I'm sure, but I think it's, it's very effective on the other hand. It gives an understanding of how sophisticated and living this tradition is. But Jack, I mean, this is just one aspect of what you raise. You know, oral performance, oral epics, what we call, right, with different variations in meanings and contextualizing and different lengths and different, I don't know. I haven't figured this one out. I mean, and, I'm, and I, won't, I won't say that the online digital text rescues us from that. I mean, we are all aware, we can now do things on a website open the text, see the variations. 
I think sometimes it can be cool. I don't think it really addresses the problem in a, in a, in a, in a real sense. Uh, from Rachel McDermott. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Gil. Wonderful talk. I wanted to ask whether we might think of the past 50 years of Bhakti translations in terms of Andre Leffer's systems of approach, that's in quotation, to translation. Each translation, or what he would call refraction, adds to the understanding of Bhakti in English receiving audiences, such as the foreignness lessens over time. Thus, the task of the translator changes over time relative to the work of former translators. Just a thought, thanks. I, I thank you so much, Rachel, for this, because indeed, aren't we the products of this lineage, right? Aren't we, don't us as the scholars move from one translation to the other, becoming better and better or more informed. But I'm, two comments, just to, for, the, for the discussion's sake. One is that, do the students follow this trajectory? Do they bother, you know, they're, are they aware? Again, I don't want to be kind of, you know, the dark, but we're in a dark age in that regard, I think. And, and the second thing is, uh, which I don't subscribe to at all. Actually, I would push against, but it's out there, is uh, Niranjana's critique, which says, no, translation is an act of resistance. Translation needs to be this translation. It should not translate. And she, she writes in, in, I mean, she does it in a very, in theoretical nomenclature that I'm not able to reproduce and I will never be able, but but she's like she's arguing for a very uh, 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 resistance mode of translation, which might run against what we're hoping to achieve here, in one way at least. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of quick questions, a couple of questions in the interest of time. Vijay Bharati, uh, there is an attempt to avoid hagiographies and highlight only vachanas in order to give a coherent and revolutionary image of the 12th century literature, which hagiographies as thought by some, some Kannada scholars try to contradict. Your reply please. And then from Alekia Maladi Emery, thank you for raising such compelling questions about translation and bhakti. You touched briefly on the difficulty of translating idioms. What is your approach in translating Kannada specific idiomatic phrases or words in this project? Thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, Vijay Bharati um, works on early Vachana's publications, 19th century, the long 19th century and 20th century. And by that, by working in Canada, introduces contextuality and historical questions and textual questions that the tradition as a religious tradition is not interested in finding out fully or not invested in, which is fine. And, but, but that, that work is, is invaluable. And I'm sure we're going to hear more of that. Um, exactly in this sense, I think that we need, our role is a little bit different. Our role is to engage intellectually. And for that, yes, we need to open up. We have to. We have to open up the, the horizon, vachanas, hagiographies, scholastic texts. So many things are out there. And um, sometimes, you know, to grow is a painful process. I, I, I agree. Um, on, on the second question uh, about Canada idioms. I mean, I could go on. I mean, soon that I'm, I don't know if he's here now, but he's, he's like, that's my pleasure of working with Sundaram, his ability to understand these idioms, but not only in Canada, right? See the, the parallels in Telugu and bring a word from Tamil. And of course, the, the, you know, Sanskrit, it's, it's just such a rich universe. I'll give you a very, and Canada is filled, filled with, you know, uh, milk and water and uh, but I'll give you, uh, but, but something which is not so much an idiom, but just show you the locality of a text. Kai Mugidu, Kai Mugidu. Kai, right hands, Mugidu, you know, 
literally closing the hands. And, and you, you cannot, this is, uh, you know, uh, Anjali, Anjali. So you, you, when you work in Canada, you're constantly jumping from kind of literal, literal, literaliness, literaliness, I don't know, um, of, of the Canada into the Sanskrit, which is embedded into the Canada and, and into the translation. So folded the palms of his hand in reveration is Kaimugidu, just to give an example of how how to move from, and this is a very thin idiom. There are of course much more rich idioms that I'm not mentioning now, but this is an example of how to how, how we stepped up. Yeah. Um, we have a, oh, we have lots of questions we haven't gotten to. If you don't mind staying for another five minutes, uh, Madhuri Deshmukh, I'm interested in learning more about your choice to translate certain prose section into verse and verse portions into prose. Presumably, the author has had some reason to put some parts in verse. What constitutes the distinction between poetic and prose language in the, to the original author and to you as translator? In regards to your final comments about whether to maintain foreignness or not, or not, reminded me of the discussion around the translations of Rumi, who was popularized in the West through Coleman Barth's very poetic translation, but which have been critiqued for taking out the Islam in Rumi. Right, no one calls Rumi, Rumi, right? Among the insiders, it's just us. Uh, but okay, so, so to, to, by the way, this issue of, um, Universalism or intimacy versus foreignness is it's a it's a false binary in a way, right? Where again, I think we're we're somewhere in between. I don't think we need to choose each one of them. Um, as to the specific question about verse and prose, it's a it's a great question. It's a very good question because partly we don't really know. You have this very rich texture of a story that has these uh, exclamations and emotional outbursts and all kind of drama. One chapter in verse, one chapter in prose. What do you make of it? I mean, how do you translate uh, uh, Dasha Kumara Charitam in Sanskrit, written in prose called Kavya, filled with parallels and, and kind of complicated embellishment? Is it, is it verse? Is it, in other words, a poem doesn't need to be only in verse. A poem can be in prose. I, I, I have a suspicion that I developed throughout this work. The prose sections in Harihara, in a way, are more poetic than the verse sections. And it might seem weird, but it's not. When you read it, that he tends to get more into this kind of thick, you know, in the prose, thick embellishments. But actually, there is a tradition. He follows maybe Champu. Maybe he follows, you know, the kind of earlier kind of the tradition of, of descriptions in prose, again, part, integral to poems. So these questions are very broad and we, I, I couldn't always find an answer in our translation work, but we, what we did, and, and here again, I admittedly, here I did something, I think we did something for the, 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 the unin, uninitiated audience to generate some kind of meaning in the structural changes that we did between verse and, for, and prose, according to the content. That is how we did this, but it's not exactly one-to-one -one of the original, definitely not. Thank you, Gil, and we'll have two last questions now. I seem to have missed these. One from Jonathan Edelman from our department here. What a rich educational talk, thank you. Regarding the target audience, one issue I've thought about in translating religiously intellectual Sanskrit texts is working with philosophers and others to hear how they hear a translation. And maybe that can be done with um, the poetry in working with um, uh, poetry and poets. And one from a student actually from USF, um, right now, and she has asked about, the, that was the very first question, which I seem to have missed, and it was on bhava and abhava and the relationship that you have here. Um, 
So can you address them? The question on Bhava and Abhava was, uh, from my, that's Avalon J. Thiessen. From my understanding, the A in the beginning of the word denotes no or not. How then are Bhava and Abhava related if they are? And she's from USF. Yes, thank you for this question because um, we worked a lot there on this Bhava Bhava. But before that, to Jonathan's comment, I thank you. It's a, uh, we try that. We try to get that kind of. It's a, it's about hearing the text. I totally agree with what you're saying, and um, it's not always easy to find those people to hear your translation or to hear the original and kind of get their feedback. But we're trying to do it as much as we can. Um, about bhava abhava, it's again. Look, it's just it's something about the magic of of Sanskrit and Indian languages and the Indian culture that allows for so many play so much playfulness and we try to make it into an advantage point in our translation in other words to be able to create a phrase that is beautiful in itself carries some of the meanings bhava bhava is bhava is a second uh, person imperative b bhava right i mean uh I, I hope maybe Bavaswa. No, no, I didn't check lately, but but there's like those kind of uh, richness. This this semantic richness can be thought of as you can always fail, or can be thought of you can always succeed, right? And uh, so concretely in 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 the, this Bava Bava particular, I'm I'm kind of running back to the slide. Uh, so we took bhava as the source of being, because he who is, and this carrying over the be of bhu, right, of bhava, the source of being is, is, is addressing the God respectfully. And that's what we wanted to convey, that kind of appreciation of God, the source of being. And then abhava, right, how can we say the paradoxes of religion, how can we say God is abhava, non-existence? Well, he is the unborn God. Again, there is something limiting with unborn, abhava, not existent. We took it to unborn God to again make it as a as a as a tool for understanding the breath of divinity as unlimited, the unborn God. He's eternal and always existed. And for that he's non-existent. Non-existent. Uh, again, uh, there is some room for poetical touches and all kinds of variations. It's a lot of work in progress, not in the sense that this is not final yet, in the sense that these ideas come only during the process. And you go back and you fix all you did before. There is kind of an inevitable process of churning and kind of honing the translation that takes a lot of time, actually. Um, I, I'm sorry keeping you longer here, Gil, but there's one more question which I missed. And that's from Daniel Weidlinger. Great presentation. My question in reference to the translation of the epithets is would, would the local people themselves have understood the Sanskrit words making up the epithet? Or in fact, are these epithets Sanskrit or are they Kannada? Even though they, they consist of Sanskrit words. I'd like to point out that the Chinese Buddhist translator translators were faced with this exact problem and some of them tried to transliterate the Sanskrit names of bodhisattvas, for example, while others tried to translate them. So some transliterated, some translated. This is great. This is a, thank you, Daniel. It's a great uh, kind of point of reference that shows us that only history will tell what have survived, right? What caught um, in, the, in the case of old Chinese, but uh, translators. Uh, but to directly answer your question, it's I, I, when I started to learn Kannada, I was amazed. I mean, you know, I had my my knowledge of Sanskrit, my imperfect knowledge of Sanskrit, and I, you know, started, and so much Sanskrit jumped to me. And I asked myself the same question: Do Kannada, you know, when they go um, in the market, right, and they buy, they, do, are they aware they're they're using Sanskrit? Probably not. 60 to 80 percent of the lexicon of the Kannada lexicon is Sanskrit, not not tadbhavas, not derivatives. Samaskrita, directly borrowed 
60 to 80 percent of this Canada lexicon. In other words, you cannot avoid, or, or I think the most reasonable imagining of an answer to your question is that Canada audience knows Canada. Doesn't, unless they go and invested or have sensibilities to Sanskrit by their education or background, they, they, they don't. Now, with Harihara, again, like I said before, things are a bit more complicated. There, I do, I do get a sense he goes, he goes Sanskrit sometimes. Sometimes he's going Marga. Sometimes he's going into the thick Sanskrit, the more subtle one with nuances that the average, average, how can I speak for an average Kanadiga of the 13th century? This is the real challenge here, but the average imagined Kanadiga wouldn't pick up. Um, most of them, some of them. Oh, maybe the audience has some Brahmins in it. Surely it has some others also. Uh, we're talking about multiple audience for my translation, but maybe we need to start by thinking about multiple audiences for Harihara in Canada. So uh, uh, thank you, Daniel, for, for uh, touching on this point. Yeah. Uh, uh. Thank you all so much for coming and staying today. Um, I'm going to ask if you can, um, I'm sorry, let me get into the right one and see if you can all unmute yourself if you so choose. Can you do that? And you're free to join in. Yeah, I, I think, yes. okay. It'll be great to have you, to have the Shruti of your voices and to convey uh -oh. our applause and gratitude to you, Gil. Next week, we have another Bhakti talk by, yes, um, by Gil, uh, a person who's worked a lot with both Jack and Gil, John Koine. And he'll be talking about Bhakti from the Maharashtra re region and also raising the more general questions that we've all faced and offering his musings on where the field of bhakti is right now. Once again, thank you all for being here and- Thank you very much. Open floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very all. much. Excellent talk yeah. and Basuda, great organization as always. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank Basu. Jeff. Thank you Basu. Yeah, thank you Basu. So nice to see everybody and so nice to hear your voices. <laughs> It's uh, wonderful to have the satsang in the middle of so much of sadness and chaos. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. I, I really like this format that's that's been developed here of, you know, these this kind of a series of talks on, over a week, over a, you know, with a week break in between. This is a really fantastic format. It really gives you some time to, to digest and, and really reflect on these really rich topics. And so I, I, th thanks for the developing this kind of great idea. If people would like, we could continue this in fall, but more at once a month and continue the yeah, series. Totally great, so, yes. Um, we, this is an experimental session. And if you'd like, changes in the format, let me know. Right now, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, adopted the one that the South Asia Seminar in Colombia is doing and been doing so well. So if, you have, if you'd like to suggest changes, we are welcome, you know, we'll certainly think about it. Well, if, thanks again, everyone. And shall we Thank say you. the end of a concert is usually a mangalam and all good wishes to all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Basu. You. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And you. Hi, Jack and bye. Thank <laughs> you.